Well, hey there, friends. It's Leslie Hughes here, principal of Punch Media and LinkedIn profile writer. And today I had the uh, pleasure of speaking with my friend Tina Trushik, who is the uh, brand manager of, uh, she's a brand leader for Trius and Peller Estates. And we talked all things experiential marketing, wine, and so much more. So I hope you enjoy my chat with Tina. Talk to you soon. So excited. I have my day drinking, day drinking wine, Trius wines. I've got the, so I'm drinking, I've got the rosé. <gasps> Good. This way. So we're going to have to talk about your new launch, which I'm so excited to talk about. Yeah. And I also have standing by, which I won't drink because it's going to, it's going to, is the, the rosé brew, right? Two years ago, Decanter Magazine scored it 97 point plant and winner. And that's an international um, recognition. That's an international award. Yep. So pretty. I mean, the bottles are so pretty. I have to, mm. I have to show them because, like, they're so pretty. And I can't wait to see your new. You have a new uh, rose, right? And that's with Peller, though. So yeah, that's with what I, Peller. I'm curious to know what the difference is between all of that. I don't know if you want to get right into it because you manage a bunch of different brands under under different pillars. So you've got Peller, you've got Trius. Yeah, so I do. I manage the uh, Trius and, and the Peller VQA portion of it because Peller also has uh, boxed wine and it's uh, a domestic blend wine. But I manage the um, portfolio where uh, just the VQA, which means 100% Ontario grapes. So that's what I, those are the two properties in, in the, um, I don't manage the properties, but I manage the brands that are associated. So that's everything from deciding what wines uh, get created what those uh, labels look like, tone and manner, and then that just gets executed uh, through various channels. I don't know how you manage it all. Anyway, I have to introduce you. I got so excited. I got really excited. Everybody knows Tina already. <laughs> I know you. I love you. Um, so I and I haven't said your name out loud to you yet, so you'll have to correct me if I've said it wrong. Okay. It's Tina Trushik, right? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, you got it right. Tina Trushik. Okay. Perfect. And then Friend Amy Riddell is it, uh, she loves her wine. So Amy Riddell nice. is on here. Um, okay, so Tina is an award-winning solutions-oriented strategic marketer and brand leader for Chris and Color Estates. And she specializes in delivering transformative experiences that evoke powerful emotional relationships and drive profitability. So we are talking about wine. And am I frozen or are you frozen? Um, I'm not frozen. No, okay. I, I probably am. It's probably. And you're not my, frozen. I'm not frozen. Okay. okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully you're not frozen. Anyway, um, well, what isn't frozen is my wine. So I'm day drinking a little, a little sip here and there isn't going to hurt anybody, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's after eleven o'clock, so that makes it legal. It is, and it's closer to it's closer to the end of the day than the beginning. Yes, it's only three hours away from five. <laughs> Well, this time I'm not going to get drunk because I think the last time I imbibed a little too much when we had a little private conversation, but I don't, hopefully nobody knew. Um, but it's it's easy. I mean, this is some nice, this is some tasty rosé. I like it very much. Good. I'm glad. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, I have so many questions to ask you. And um, oh, so we've got Amy who loves ta the topic of wine and Goody saying wine, glorious wine. So I think there's a few people that are just excited. That must be. Honestly, Tina, people must get so excited, like I did, when we first heard it talking because of where you work. Like, it's not like, oh, I work at blah, blah, blah. I create widgets. When you go, like, I work at a winery, people are like, oh, do tell me more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. There's a, there's a lot of romance around the product. It's not like we're creating toothpaste. Yeah. Not yeah. that there's anything wrong with creating toothpaste. No, but it's not a, it's a product that is, it's a luxury product, really. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs it, but people love it. And there is, and I think we've had this conversation too. There is a certain poshness about wine as well, um, which I, I, that's one of the reasons why um, you've probably seen him too. Gary Vaynerchuk made it so big was because he sort of brought down the, I don't know, the Gigi, the like. The, Intimidation. Right. Of wine. Yeah. And he, you know, he looked like the Wayne's World version of, of wine tasting. So I can't wait to talk to you about like experience. So actually, let's just get into it. So, okay. so experiences are a big part of what you do and you launch the trees tours. And so for sure. Um, so that's and I see that that's kicking back up again, obviously, with the pandemic hopefully coming to an end. Yeah. Well, the, the trees, the trees tour was um, like a, a 
one of my most favorite projects of my career. And I'll tell you why. Um, I've been in the wine business, whether or not it was at first through LCBO for 13 years and then um, with Andrew Peller. So over 20 years of wine and you go to a winery experience and they're all very lovely. It's a bit intimidating. So you don't want to feel stupid when you're there. And, you, you know, they talk about the terroir and they talk about the different grapes and what to taste and what to smell and you know i've been a, i've been in the business for 20 years i still can't tell the difference between green pepper and and um and anything else so you know it's not it, it it's it's not something that you um need to worry about and so taking a look at that whole intimidation factor and taking a look at where um the winery consumer so those younger consumers are not necessarily drinking as much wine as the older cohorts so we created an experience based on the um consumer being at the center of their experience so they go to the winery and we we had zones and stations uh, built around our hero products, the ones that did the well and did the best and won the most awards. And then we just made it fun and immersive and exciting. So we have the Trius Rose Lounge where we've got, you know, wisteria flowers coming from the ceiling and you can take pictures against a flower wall. And then you can still have learning there, but it's at your own pace and you become the hero of your own experience. And so the wine just becomes an accessory that you get to carry and put in a picture. But you are immersed in the experience and, the ex and, and you are the hero because you get to take selfies and you get to let everyone know you're having a grand old time at Trius. And then when you get home in your condo downtown in Liberty Village, you get to go to your local LCBO store and bring that connection back to life by you know, purchasing the product and remembering how fun it was to be on property. Yeah, I love that that you you're making the the user the hero of the experience because mm -hmm. oftentimes probably in the past with brands it was always like we own the ex you know we own the experience of the brand but you're turning it on its heels and making the person the hero of the experience. Yeah, and most wineries all it's a teaching environment where you know the the um, the wine expert is standing behind a desk and telling everyone how to smell and telling telling everyone how to taste and it's. Um, you know, it's good if you're super interested and you're you're a super uh, a super user, but if you don't know too much about wine, you're trying to kind of elevate your knowledge. It's still pretty intimidating, so you kind of walk away going, mm, "I took away maybe 15 percent of that." Whereas, you know, you're you're involved in the trees experience, so it's not intimidating. It's fun. People can relate to it, and it's a reflection of um, you and and the experience that you had. Well, it's so true, and I, I felt a little bit better as I've gone on a few of the tours in wine country, and I can't wait to come and see you soon, um, is, is having gone through that, and I kept thinking, like, am I missing something that, I mean, I like in one place, like, there's one thing that I like in one place, and there's another thing that I like in another place, and, like, what am I missing here, because the, should I like a Cabernet Sauvignon, should I, like, what should I be liking, and I was like, I don't know, I'm just getting drunk, like, <laughs> And, and hey, listen, I ask the same question over and over again. There are, and, and wine is so personal. So if you like the deep and dark and heavy ones, you're always going to like the deep and dark and heavy. So some cap soaps are awesome. Some are just too tannic. There's others that are big and fruity. I like California. It depends how much sun they get. So there's a lot of chemistry and, and, and uh, viticultural science behind that. But you like what you like. And yeah. That's okay. You know, 90% of people, my opinion, I don't have insights to prove it, but I'm, I bet you my bottom dollar that 90% pick a label and that reflects them and pick a varietal that they like the best. And uh, when you present a bottle wherever you go, it's a reflection of yourself. So no answer, you know, no, no answer is a bad answer. Yeah. And so I know that your career started in the fashion industry. So fashion must have a lot to do with branding and experiences and wine and that kind of stuff. Do you find that? Do you find that? Yeah, I take a look at it through that lens for sure. Um, you know, I think wine is, you know, we're lucky right now. Wine's always been kind of fashionable, but it has different levels. And, you know, fashion trends are what people you know, tell you what's current and what's in the market. And, and so, you know, same thing with wine trends, whether or not, there's you know certain varietals or trends like better for you and what does that look like low sugar low alcohol but you know fashion's also about personal style and you know you 
find a wine or a brand that that reflects your personal style and in the, the the taste profile that you like the best and you kind of see yourself in that brand and that's that's where we can have a lot of fun with the various brands and how we um, communicate that through the label and through you know the tone and the matter and the voice and the personality of the brand so you know everyone's got a wine that is their wine mm -hmm. and it's so experiential too so i know one of the things that you guys have had and i just noticed today that it, it's um it was temporary stop because of the um it might get, be getting too hot are these domes that you have ah uh, yes yeah so, so we had we we brought them to life um Oh gosh, to pre-pandemic where we have like these dome dinner experiences and kind of really elevated the experience. We've got an amazing restaurant and Chef Dodd is one of the best in Niagara, very farm to table. If you ever get a chance, I mean, the meals are, it's my favorite place and I'm not just saying that because I work here. Mm -hmm. um, but we were able to kind of create these uh, meaningful experiences and then the pandemic hit. And so we had these domes and we were able to at least execute family bubbles within these domes and it felt very safe. And then we brought them out in the back to um, have um, tastings that we can, again, keep everyone in their safe bubble. And so depending on the weather, you know, we got to, Get a fan in there. It gets a little heated sometimes, but we can make it work. As a girl who's always cold, I have a fan at my feet right now. As a girl who's always cold, I'm sure that I would love, I would love to be in a toasty warm dome. I mean, it's June 23rd and I'm freezing. I see you have a sweater on too, so you must be just, just, just like me. Air, air conditioning, air. lots of air conditioning. Oh, yes. Um, and so, um, so actually, so we've talked, I was a little bit under the misconception of that maybe alcohol, um, consumption would have gone down only because bars and restaurants weren't open and you give me some insights that no it went way up uh, a lot of us a lot of us were drinking me included um over the with the pandemic yeah, for sure we weren't we weren't driving most people weren't driving and um yeah, yeah you know the, even though we did see significant um sales decrease in the in the on-premise channel for sure i mean that that, that whole industry was was almost decimated so it's 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 too bad and it's really great to hear to to see that the patios are opening and the municipalities are kind of opening up you know street parking and just kind of really supporting that industry to kind of bring them back on their feet mm -hmm. um, but we found that consumers ended up um, buying in bulk making less trips uh, buying in grocery so they can do a bit of a twofer where they you know buy the groceries and their wines and then they just don't you know show up in various places um and then people you know pre-pandemic there was a lot of drinking with dinner and meals whereas now we saw some of the research come back as drinking to uh de-stress to relax um you know day in day in um zoom meetings back to back a little glass of wine before dinner not bad idea right yeah and as you said like and i i Usually, I don't consume that much wine. I mean, you know, it, but I did think about getting box wine at some times too, because I'm like, I don't want to make reoccurring trips to go to the grocery store, and maybe buying the box wine would have been a smarter uh, yeah, convenience. Mm -hmm, convenience for not having to go back and forth, and 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 people staying in their in their little friend bubbles. And and since my friend Amy's on, we we had this games night every uh, every every other Friday, and like we we drink we drink our games night. Pretty heavy drinking goes on in our fun games nights. So. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. So so uh, so your the trees experience. I even actually just before we got on this um, call today, uh, I saw some. You do have you still have tours going for? There's even there yeah. We've modified our tours for sure. Uh, all our uh, experiences, we've modified them to outdoor experiences. So we've got mm -hmm. a big property, and it's a bit of a village style. So we're able to kind of um conduct them we don't go into the cellar and we don't go into um the trius red we have a big uh trius red dining room because it's inside and those are the regulations so we we find ways to accommodate and have people experience our wine in a meaningful way so um you know we've kind of we go with the flow gotta yeah. go with the flow well again and like you know i'm sure that there's going to be some adjustment too from 
people wanting to be around other people. It's, I think some of us, I mean, I'm, I'm thankfully I'm second, I have my second back, so I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable going out. But I think for a lot of us, this whole new, do we hug? Do we not hug? Do we get, how close do we get to people? That whole, that whole social situation is going to be a little bit awkward. I think at first as we sort of reclimatize to. Yeah, for sure. Even our tourism experience, you know, we've added, um, jobs that we didn't have before in terms of all the various stations we've got hosts that come in and you know they take your information you've got to scan in for um for tracking and tracing and, and doing all those you know re regulatory issues where you know i don't know where it's going to be two years from now but two years ago we you know those those positions didn't exist so you know we've we've made modifications to make sure that we're playing in a safe environment but still getting back to business so Mm hmm. Yeah. So, OK, so I want to go back to talking about this new launch of this. Yeah. new uh, this new. Brand. So what goes into like, is there there must be a lot that goes into the launch of a new brand, a new wine. What yeah. You know, um, you know, the fun part is that the very like the last mile is where the fun part is, because that's where you kind of create and you make, you know, you, you get to to see that that uh, baby come to life. But. It, with like with anything, it's 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 uh, driven by insights. What's going on in the market? You know, the Nutrius Rosé. Uh, no, sorry, the Peller Rosé Light is a low alcohol project that I started working on a couple of years ago, and um, you know, working with winemaking, saying you know, can we? Can, what would low alcohol look like? What would it taste like? We did a bit of a an experiment, and so with this particular product, this was a bit fast to market because the winemaking team said actually um we got it so you know usually it's kind of like the rd takes a little while you make some mistakes you keep going but they nailed it right near the beginning so we said let's label it and we um launched it so it's only available on e-commerce and um we're testing it as, as a pilot so it still tastes amazing beautifully chilled on a patio but it's just a little bit less alcohol so instead of the 13 percent, you're at nine percent so um you know it's a little lighter we're, we're experimenting with other um other better for you um categories but so that's you know it's all driven in insights and and what the consumer's looking for and trying to figure out um what that is before they even know that they want it that's awesome yeah because yeah. I, I i had an experience i think it was well, it was obviously pre-pandemic where I was out at a restaurant and I had two glasses of wine. They were healthy pours of glasses of wine. And I thought, oh, I've got you know two glasses. I I have one of those little breathalyzers on the keychain that I carry with me, and I blew over. So those so that kind of a wine that has less alcohol content, I still want to have the experience of drinking the yeah. wine. But I was like, I was so shocked because I was I couldn't believe that I had blown. Oh, thankfully I had that little keychain with me that like tell me, but yeah. Then, They'll have those two glasses of wine and not worry as much that I'm I'm gonna you know consume too much to be able to drive home. So I, I, that's a, that's a, I'm excited about that's really yeah yeah I'm we're we're excited to see to see the results and and see how meaningful low alcohol translates into consumers. But we're so lucky that we've got a wine making team that can kind of turn it around and, and an operations team that goes okay let's stick it in a bottle let's put you know let's get the label on it let's see what happens so. Um, you know, it's good to be that nimble and that flexible and have the freedom to, you know, see what happens. Yeah. Cause how many, I mean, if you can name, like, you don't not name them, but how many brands are you overseeing at the same time? So I've got about, I'm going to say two and a half. Cause one of the brands I oversee, I see with a partner out of BC because it's a national brand that just launched good natured, but within these brands, you know, so Trius has 42 SKUs. So it's wow. 42, right. Right. So That's they have different lot. tiers and different varietals. And so we've got a reason, a Pinot Grigio and a blend and a white blend and a red blend. So there's there's um, the scope of each brand is really quite deep. And um, everyone, everyone gets a little baby love. <laughs> yeah, Mama's only got so much time. <laughs> that's a lot to manage under one yeah. it's like having a bunch of different clients. And and so I know with marketing, we talked about this before. I mean, it's not obviously it's not just a one-stop shop like the experience that you've got to manage from a marketing perspective is on-premise yes. in you know in store 
social media. I mean, you're, I, I don't know how, how do you manage it all? How do you, you know? well, it's, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit tough. And with Trius, it's getting a little bit easier because everyone understands the brand and the tone and the manner. And, and we've got a bit of a, a system going on where if anything happens within, we got um, our own stores. They're the wine shops. Um, and so anything that happens there, you know, it, it's brought back to, to my desk to make sure that everything's on brand. But the, everyone who touches the trees brand is very versed in the tone, the manner and what it's supposed to look like and feel like. So um, as as a multifunctional, cross-functional, um, multi-channel uh, group, we are pretty good at making sure that we're delivering a seamless consumer experience. But that's the hard part. And that takes time. Oh, for sure. Because, yeah. you know, the one thing that I think a lot of people who are not in marketing don't understand is that a brand isn't just a logo. Yeah. It is an experience. And it has to, to your point, like, it has to be the, the, the consumer is the hero. Like, it, what is their, and everyone's going to experience it differently, but what is that experience? And then how do oh, you for sure. personalize it with all yeah. the yeah, that's, yeah. That's so what we try to do, like, let's say you're buying a Trius bottle um, from a shelf at the LCBO, you take a look at the back, you get some information. It may not be the same experience that you have on property, but how the bottle feels and the texture on the label and the beautifulness of the design is still a Trius experience, same as you would when you're on property, the wind's blowing your hair and you're taking a picture of yourself in the vineyards. That again is also a beautiful Trius experience. So you know, having having those multiple touch points, you know, e-com is a little different. Um, you know, going through our, our sales channel, and we're you know we're as as um, most organizations we we had an e-com channel, uh, but we've really amped it over the the pandemic year. So we're still you know we're still figuring out what that experience looks like in all our channels. But we're pretty. We're pretty good with some of our brands in terms of our omni-channel experience. Yeah, and so when um, when the decision was, in, and especially in Ontario, because I, I keep thinking of this as just like an Ontario experience. It's not even an, just an Ontario experience because you're across Canada. <laughs> well, Peller is Ontario is um, believe it or not, Ontario is a majority Ontario experience. Yeah, they don't have. They've got some. Trius is sold in Manitoba uh, and in some Atlantic cities, but not so much in the West. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's the thing that I sometimes I forget, even as it can, like, I, this is why I think there's the joke of, like, how many Torontonians is it can just in a light bulb, one to hold the bulb and the rest to move the world around them. Right. Uh, because, you know, I, I've lived and grown up here in Ontario thinking, oh, well, everybody's experience across Canada is the same, which is, no, that's not necessarily true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got the property, and that definitely helps when you have a property that, um, you know, defines how the brand comes to life, then there is um, there is that um, beacon of that is what it looks like. When you don't have a property and you don't have a tangible way to bring it to life, then that just makes it a little harder, that's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when, um, you know, when they made this decision, when the government made the decision to have wines in grocery stores, did that help? Did that help consumption? Did it change consumption at all? For sure. We, um, you know, we were a bit um, watchful on how this grocery channel was going to come. We were very, um, with with us in particular, we have um, the TWS stores, the, sorry, the wine shop stores, that a few of them we were taking on the other side of the uh, grocery aisle. So I don't know if, if you remember that some of them, you leave your shopping experience and then you'll see the wine shop on your way out well some of our stores we took it on the other side of the cash register and so it's store in store experience so we kind of really tested and, and took a look at, at the grocery consumer from from that lens and then you know kind of expanded it out groceries on fire right now i think pandemic definitely um expedited that in my opinion uh just be able to um like i said condense your shopping trips out of the house and so, you know, grocery is definitely um, here to stay and, and we'll see how um, the the licenses get expanded and see how much more that looks like. I don't know what, you know, grocery and corner stores are going to look like, but that's kind of, you know, that discussion with the government's pending. I don't know where we're at right now, but, you know, I think how we purchase alcohol is going to be very different in the next five to ten years. Yeah, which I think is, I mean, making it more accessible, um, you know, I think is, is a good, I mean, we I go to the States all the time, and it's mm -hmm. accessible anywhere. 
And I and I I'd like to think. I mean, I haven't done obviously any studies on does it you know does it create more addiction? I, you know, like it's just that the accessibility of it is it's just a nice thing to have. But that's yeah. <laughs> well, I think the government's issue um, is twofold. One, you know, ensuring that social responsibility is always paramount, making sure that you know you're serving in an, an appropriate way, and two, uh, finding out how revenue can still be generated for the province because LCBO. Um, is a um, is a bit of a powerhouse for the government to be able to pay for you know the services that the government provides. So it's making sure that that revenue stream stays whole for all of us. Right, which is why you know if anybody were to ever ask, well, why is our wine up here in Canada so much more expensive than it is in the states? It's probably because of that, right? Because of the government. Yeah, I, for sure. What if you don't? <laughs> if you can't get into no, it. no, it's okay. I, I used to I used to work for the LCBO for sure. I think that there's um, those those tariffs too. And two is um, you know Ontario is is the the labor that the cost of of land in Ontario as you know you probably all the newspapers. I mean it, everything's on fire. So you know the the value of the land, the value of the equipment, the the making wine in Ontario is more expensive than you know making wine in a different country so all right. of that kind of ladders up but yeah. you get value for the taste so it's worth every penny absolutely absolutely um so kind of pivoting into talking about social media um you know a lot of uh i know that you like that you have invested a lot in brand ambassadors and all that that, that, that kind of experience were you ever concerned about negative like backlash or like how the consumer experience was going to be, you know, like, were you ever concerned about that? Like, oh, social media is going to like, you know, is there going to be Yeah, problems? no. And I'll tell you why is because we felt confident that because the consumer was in the center of their social media experience, that it was so personal and it was never really... I mean, it's about us, but it's not about us. It's about them in our environment. So, um, you know, if anything, social media has has been the driver. User content has has been a driver for us uh, because people want to see themselves in the same situation. And any kind of negative, I mean, we usually, if there's something, you know, maybe something with their experience, we take it offline or if there's some kind of questions around, you know, legitimacy of any kind of one statement we've made we'll take it off the line but other than that we we really haven't felt a lot of negative again because we've put everyone in the center of their own experience so that kind of worked for us yeah that's the one thing i, I teach uh i mean in my classes is it's not necessarily that someone's going to say something bad about your brand it's how you respond mm -hmm. people just want to feel heard at the end of the day and driving that traffic offline and saying we're still here for you we want to hear your experience. We're and we're empathetic to whatever whatever the perceived experience oh, yeah. is going on. We want to know. We want to we want to be a part of this so that we can rectify it if if if, if need be. Um, if yeah, and we'll make a phone call. Like it's not like we'll just respond in a DM. We'll go, okay, you know, let's take this offline. Can I get your phone number? We'll call. We'll we'll make it right. We'll invite them back. So all of a sudden, whatever their experience, we'll still make it a human experience. So. You know, we're we're pretty, and we can do that because it doesn't happen very often. I have to be honest. Well, that's good though. Yeah. I, I was listening to a podcast. It was a actually it was a webinar with Seth Godin, whom I like absolutely adore. Seth Godin and Brian Solis. And I think it was Seth Godin who said that he was. Um, he, he said with every single uh, customer feedback form that he would fill out, he would say at the very end of it, "If you want my, if you really want my insight." here's my contact information with his phone number and his email address. He said, never has he ever had anyone contact him for more mm -hmm. insight. He's like, there's one thing about gathering data. Sure. People can fill out a form and say, yes, they had a great experience or no, they didn't. But what really is a true experience? So I love to hear that you're actually picking up, like someone's actually attending to. The oh yeah. Oh yeah. We really do want to hear from you. Cause I think that that's, that's a really the experience is, is the experience is paramount to the brand experience. So if they have a poor experience on property, they're not going to buy our wine when they get home. Like if they feel like they're heard and they, they, they all around and we've brought them back into the fold, into the family, we're good. Yeah. Like anything, right? Like with anything. 
did you learn all of this? So I know when we first started talking and you had uh, launched the Indie Motorcycle Cafe, which was like a bazillion years ago. I know. That's a hundred years ago. I know. I know. But did you learn about experience then that helped to take you into like, is, is it basically been a whole bunch of different things that have sort of laddered up or was it just, is it just intuitive? You just treat people the way we want to be treated or both? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things. I think the Indian motorcycle experience was um, taking a very young girl, throwing her into the deep end of the pool and then letting her go. So, I mean, that was that was a, a harrowing and exciting experience all in one. So I'll never take that again, uh, take that away or do that again. Um, but I don't, you know, it's, I, I'd have to say that it kind of started um, showing up when I was at the LCBO and how we were going to bring um, a very mundane alcohol purchase. And again, this is even before my time where LCBO stores were, were built on side streets. You'd go in, you'd fill in a sheet, you'd leave with a paper bag. So kind of transforming people's impression of what alcohol purchase can be and you know, bringing this to uh, bringing the store to life in, in nesting tables and entertainment corners and kitchens. We used to have kitchens in LCBO stores. So really making the experience of retailing um, exciting and a reason why you want to linger longer, stay around, come back, because there might be something new that you missed the last time. So and that that manifested itself into the winery and the property experience when you really had like super control uh, and 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 deep creativity on what that whole thing could look like and so when they you know my my greatest joy is when I go on property and I kind of walk around and see how people are reacting all this these beautiful creations that that were created and um, seeing them joyful and excited and and in it and immersed and it's like okay check where she's she's with us for life and you get to and, be a fly in the wall right because yeah you know who you are and you get to sort yeah. of see it through their eyes in a way right yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah yeah and there's so going on though because with color estates i know um I, I don't think you're necessarily you're not necessarily responsible for like the, the wayne gretzky no the way the wayne gretzky brand is a colleague of mine sarah yeah she manages that brand but that's a lot to manage under one, um, mm -hmm. under one like umbrella, of, like one big overarching brand. Um, so it's, it's yeah. Well, there's a lot of players that like everyone gets a piece of that um, responsibility. So there's a whole like hospitality team that you know they're accountable and responsible for that, and they do their thing and they're experts at that. And and then there's that whole other you know brand expert um, aspect to make sure that you know everything stays cohesive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, then you gotta look at the ROI of all that fun. So that's not the part that yeah. I like. <laughs> the math yeah. part is that I'm like, eh, get to decide the which babies get to stay, which babies have to go. Oh, that must be hard, though. If um, we yeah, you know, we're we we um we're pretty good, and I have again, I'm, I'm coming back to to Trius. Um, we we also have a bit of a strategic approach at, at you know some of the SKUs we have at the um, estate experience is different than what you'd have at the LCBO because there's a reason to go to all these various different channels and what we have in our own stores might be a little bit different so we take a bit of a channel approach mm -hmm. to um, make sure that every consumer that goes into their particular uh, favorite shopping environment has something special that they can't get anywhere else so we kind of play that too, making sure that um, they've got they've got a, a special, unique experience. Yeah, which uh, which then has to be done for every sub brand, <laughs> which is, is, is interesting, right? Yeah. yeah. And I just like my brain just kind of went down this path of like thinking about the supply chain management of all that. And, and most of us just think about this, but we don't necessarily think about how this gets to be from the grape to the processing to the bottles to the distribution to the you know, oh. it's 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 bigger than one would think when you know you're just sitting down and having you know, a glass of wine and knocking them back right? oh we 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 meet as a cross-functional uh team every two weeks like all year round and projects are of course are at various stages of completion but everything from you know bottles to stelvins to you know 
the the Texas um, blackout um, that happened earlier this year affected you know bottle production and and how that manifests its way a couple of months later into you know bottle inventory. So you know we really live in a, a small global bubble that um, everything's affected. So we constantly constantly stay in close check with with all pieces of the business. And, and is that does that do you have a pretty tight-knit community in the wine industry in Niagara on the Lake? Is that is that the same thing? Yeah, it, yeah. for sure. We have a, an industry, and there's a few industries that that uh, stay together, um, and we share more of the overarching um, larger issues, not necessarily you know competitive uh, information. But uh, together as an industry, we you know we take a look at how we can, as an Ontario wine industry, compete and get more shelf space in the LCBO or get more exposure to the LCBO buyers um, as an industry. Um, and so there's a lot of collaboration that happens that way as well, yeah. Oh, that's cool. And um, Stephen says hi, obviously. He's so Oh, hi, Stephen. Stephen from the Canadian Marketing Association. Um, so, yeah, so because, so I know you were on the, if you, I'm just trying to remember from your LinkedIn profile, you were on the board, if not like for that sort of, for that experience, like Niagara experience too, right? So that, that all of this sort of just seems to like be like yeah so i sit on the board of um the tourism partnership of niagara which is the regional tourism organization so that's also linked so not only is niagara falls the number one demand generator for tourism in canada but um so i'll tell you something a few years back uh the number two top reasons people visit toronto is niagara falls and one country so that was kind of um internationally so you know we have um wine tourism is is embedded into you know how we can um integrate that experience into into broader industry view as well so it's really everything's really quite connected yeah well i have to say even though i mean i'm closer to prince edward county it, it wasn't i mean it was a nice experience to go there and try it out it was it's a completely different uh experience in niagara in the lake probably because the proximity and, and the collaboration of if I'm taking a tour, I'm going to multiple different places and, and there doesn't seem to be any sort of like, you know, from a user experience, any competitive sort of feeling. It was, it was very sort of seamless going to different place from one place to the next. And it's almost like, let's just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya as long as everybody gets a good experience. That's all that matters. Yeah, for sure. And we're a much more um, mature market. So we've been around a little like a longer than Prince Edward County, but they've got some great properties and they've got some really unique um, experiences. And so it's been, it's been what, three years since I've been there pre pandemic, but uh, it's a great community down there. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it seems to be quite a bit, a little bit of a hot, like a hot, a hot yeah. tourist spots, but like, and it's for sure, and it's like probably a lot closer. <laughs> it's a lot closer to my neck of the woods, and but I'm still coming to see you anyway, and I'm very all excited. right. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, so, so what do you love? Like, I know, and uh, this, this, okay, I went in two different directions with my brain. I went like, I'm so excited that you're going to be starting your EMBA very soon. I'm so excited. Three to weeks. I wish that I could just shadow you on that. I'm so excited. Um, but then my, my brain goes into then like, what do you love most about what you do? Like what really just gets you excited about? You yeah, know? I think I touched on it a little bit. Um, for me, the creation of beauty and happiness. So my most favorite thing is to walk on property and just see people, you know, squeal in delight and, and see how the face of the property has changed. You know, four years ago, we go on property, you see a lot of salt and pepper. Uh, and what I mean by that is people my age. And then, um, well, a little bit more pepper than salt, but we'll see. Um, but and then, you know, you know, last summer and the summer before, you know, there's a lot of younger millennials, you know, a lot of floral dresses and, and beautiful uh, hats taking pictures of themselves like I loved it. And so I'm, you know, introducing a whole new market by having people really happy and really excited to be experiencing what they've seen on social media and then sharing it to their group. So that makes me happy or I'll go to an LCBO store and I'll see and I'll if I see someone kind of perusing through the trius labels and overhearing and and you know having them touch and feel and react to something that I've created and makes them happy that that is joy for me. Yes, yeah. And I've seen some of the pretty pictures because we worked on that on your profile of like that I mean the the, the pinks and the 
you know, the labeling and everything, mean, the fine details that go into everything. I can't show this properly, but like the yeah. fine details that goes into like, everything. Can you touch on that? There's texture. It's not like yeah. it's all the details. Details matter. It does. It really does. And it is really pretty. The bottle's pretty and the um, everything. It's just gorgeous. Just love it. Um, and so did you come, did you make changes when you arrived at Trius? Were there a lot of changes to be made or were there oh, sort yeah. of, did you have to grandfather things over and things like that? Or? No, I mean, you know, it, it takes time and, and part of, um, part of being able to make the changes is a having leadership that's open to your vision and saying, listen, this is I, like, this is what I think we should do. And then being able to, to, to kind of convince them that trust me, this is what I think we should do. So, you know, there was a lot of support from the top to be able to um, to lead that. So um, the estate manager, his name is Tim, we partnered together. Um, I pulled together the creative portion in creating what that experience was gonna look like and feel like, and he was able to operationalize it and look at it from a lens of how are we gonna get people in, how are we get people out? And, um, you know, together we were able to, to create this um amazing experience and to be able to sell the experience so visual how have them visualize it we came up with of course you know the financials and what that was going to look like how we're going to pay that off um you know what we're going to charge you know the whole the whole pnl right because it's not just about i think this is a great idea this is a great idea and this is how it can become profitable over time right yeah because it's, yeah, it's the business like as much as it you know you gotta you gotta kind of Put the business chops to the ideas too. Yeah, which is um, probably the stuff that I don't wouldn't want to look at most. So. But the, the interesting thing was I had a conversation with somebody who's a senior senior leader like yourself who said, you know, when it comes to those the P and L, um, you know, there is a story behind it, and so look at it as storytelling. Don't just look at it as numbers and getting frustrated with the fact, you know, somebody else can maybe put the numbers together, but just extrapolate from that. What is the story here, and where you know what can we pull from that? Which was like, oh, that's that's a that's a better way for looking at it for me because I do love the storytelling. I do love storytelling. So. Well, we're lucky in our organization because it's a it's a family run organization. You know, we're not. No one's looking at it for okay. What are we going to do this quarter? Everyone's got a bit of a longer term, saying okay. You know what? You know what? What's it going to look like in three years from now? So there's less pressure to deliver tomorrow than there is. Okay, we're going to make the investment today, and then we're going to see that payoff in dividends. So that was really the benefit of Trius, is we were able to build equity and not be tied to the pressure of making quarter numbers. Because once you start doing that, it's very short sighted and it's tough. Um, yeah, I guess I never really thought about that. That's, that's a very really interesting. Thing. So do you think that there's any misconceptions about what people would think about what you do? That's right, where my brain kind of went earlier, as I said, like that, um, I guess, supply chain management. Like, that, like, Are there other misconceptions that people have about you know, maybe your role or what, you know? Yeah, um, as much as um, wine is a combination of science and art. So you need to make sure that, you know, all the winemakers have chemistry backgrounds and they have the art of blending it all in. And then, you know, you've got the operations people that, you know, kind of pull that all together in the regular supply chain. And you've got the other, you know, financial people finding out if this idea is viable or not viable and taking a look at, at all the various, um, the various components. So as much as the end experience is a beautiful bottle of wine and an amazing experience, there's, um, there's a lot of business that goes into, and I mean by business is that, you know, there's a lot of insights, everything we create is driven in consumer insights and research and, and financials and then more financials and then taking everyone through all the various product stages. So there's, there's a lot of lugging before we get to go and create and then just sit back and enjoy it. It's, it's, you know, sometimes it's quick, like this, this um, rosé that happened really quite quickly. Sometimes it takes two years. Sometimes we got to make, we got to make plans that I've got to plant. If we want to do something special, it's three years out because we've got to plant the vineyards. We've got to wait for the grapes to grow. We've got to, you know, treat, what happens through harvest a little differently with, you know, sun consumption, etc. So all the decisions, there's so many facets to it. So that would be um, that. I don't know if it's a misconception, but that's always people get surprised when I kind of go into detail of how much 
we have to do before we get to drink. Right, and before you get to the pretty stuff, which is the, yeah. the labels and the branding and the, the, as you said, that is sort of experience. And so, so has so since you've been on board, the experience has changed. So can you like walk me through a little bit about like what the experience is sort of like? You said there was like, um, I've seen from pictures and things like that, very Instagrammable experience. Um, so you said there's things like there's I can't remember what kind of plant you said that hang is hanging. Down. So you want to know what the zones are? Is that what you just asked? Sorry, I didn't well, hear. Yeah, like a little yeah, bit. Okay, yeah. yeah. So um, when you come to Trias, you get welcomed uh, with uh, some sparkling. And the first, the first um, zone, if you will, is up on a second story uh, lookout. We call it the Trias Rose uh, Lookout Lounge, where you get to learn a little bit about our Trias Rose. Take a sip, take some pictures, and then uh, in a perfect world, post pandemic will take you to the um, sparkling barrel. So Trius is the oldest and the largest sparkling um, seller in Canada. And once you open those doors, I don't want to give it away, but oh my God, you open these doors. And what we did was we hung glass balls from the ceiling and uh, shone lights on them. So when you open this very dark black tunnel, you see all these glass balls above you that, um, it is made, it, you, you are made to feel like you're walking into a, a, a glass of sparkling wine where there's, you're surrounded by bubbles and sounds. And then um, you go and you check out the um, sparkling cellar. We have um, spell, smelling stations where um, you get to kind of test your nose in terms of identifying what those um, smells are, the aromas are in, in sparkling wine. We take you to the Trias cellar where that's our, um, we're just celebrating this year our 30th vintage um, of Trius Red. So we're one of the oldest, if not the oldest, um, consecutive red wines in Ontario. Um, so we have a whole um, area there. Um, and then we take you to the sparkling house where you can actually sit in the tub, take a picture, uh, or you can sit on a swing, which is an upside down um, uh, sparkling wine cage. And... Um, and you have a little bit of sparkling brut rosé with a little bit of um, cotton candy for fun. Oh, that's hilarious. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I so, did you come up with this idea of having these balls hanging from the ceiling and having that? Well, it's a collaborative approach. So we, we um, so I'm going to say yes. And, and it's like any good idea, you know, ideas bubble up. Um, right. We went to New York three years ago um, and just check out Rosé Mansion in New York City. It was a paid uh, experience uh, downtown Manhattan. And um, they had a lot of those elements that I thought, oh my gosh, like this would be so much fun. So we both went, um, Tim and I, and then, you know, created the experience. And and um, so, yes, you know, having the, the balls uh, hanging from the ceiling, uh, you know, painting the, the hallway uh, black, adding the lights, if we all just kind of, we had the idea and then we just added elements to it to make it like fantastic because that would be so that was like multi-sensory in a way like oh yeah not just so it's not just because every everybody processes an information visual auditory kinesthetic and that would be a very kinesthetic way of really finding your way because you're like you're living the bo the bottle experience <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that sounds and so you know cool. like we had the tub and the tub was was um uh, something that I really wanted it to happen because the tub is surrounded by gold and white bubbles. And so, you know, there's always room for more bubbles and it was kind of a double entendre. And, and, and that has been like a killer uh, Instagrammable, uh, one of the most Instagrammed um, pieces too. And, and so there's just, there was just lots of pieces. We still have work to do. There's still a lot more ideas that we didn't even uh, get to, but yeah, we're pretty like I'm really of, proud of it. Walk through the through the you know the place almost like with an eye for what how can we transform this into a social media experience even. Like yeah, we had to take for sure because the the experience prior to that was a bit um, typical. We'd go to one station, we'd drink wine at a table, we'd go into the vineyards, and then we would talk about you know uh, terroir and the soil and which is interesting, but. Okay. Yeah. Whereas, you know, like, I'm going to be honest, you know, I, four, four winery tours talking about terroir, I'm kind of done. Um, so, you know, we, we just, we just made it more fun and, and just about the consumer. And is, is, is the experience that, I mean, of course you're going to be a little biased, but is the experience that you get at the tree or color states, 
is it quite different than or are they all than some of the other um like other wineries in the, in the Niagara region or is everybody trying to create their own Instagrammable um I think we're definitely leaders like I I don't think there's a winery that is as Instagrammable in Canada and I'm gonna say um other than maybe Raymond in, in Napa but um I don't think so um, and I think people are are kind of catching on to having these opportunities where you have a beautiful backdrop where people can put themselves in. Um, but I, I have to say that I think our experiences, like at least with Trius, we've got the tour. At Peller, we have the 10 Below Ice Room where you can kind of put on a park gun, feel what it feels like at 10 Below um, Zero and you know, taste ice wine, because that's what Peller is, is their signature skew. And then, you know, at Gretzky's, we've got the, you know, we've got the pond in the winter, we have an ice rink, which, you know, there's not really any other winery that has a Wayne Gretzky ice rink uh, in Niagara Lake. So we do have really authentic experiences. And, you know, I think that's good. I think that, um, you know, everything floats all boats. So if we have people come into Niagara because they want to see Trius and they want to see Peller, then they'll go and experience other uh, properties as well. So I think that's just, it's good for everybody, not just for us, but for the industry as well. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, we're, we're probably pretty unique in our experiences for sure. And does that, does that make, well, I, I, that's, I mean, cause that's where I think of, like when I think of fashion and I think of that, I think of like that, that would really lend itself. Like your background in fashion really lends itself to those experiences from the, from like, just from that lens um, to be, you know, to be visual. For sure. Cause I think fashion comes from anything. It comes from art. It comes from, you know, what's happening in, in political science. It's happening um, in pop culture. And so I think, that translates into wine and you know what's happening in people's lives and how are they adapting and how are they consuming and and then how that gets translated on the bottle gets to be fun and fashionable and stylish and reflective of of what's happening mm -hmm. yeah because the one thing that i know about brands and the one thing that i do teach my 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 students and and some of my clients too is that brands aren't just, as i said before it's not just a logo but it is how someone feels about it and how do they, how, like, what does, what does this mean when they're picking it up and what does this represent to me as, and this is what I'm just mirroring back what you're saying from the beginning, when I pick this up and I walk out and I put this on the counter or, or like to, to buy it or whatever, what am I saying about myself? Oh, it's a reflection of you. When you bring a bottle of wine as one should, as a, as a hostess gift or what yeah. have you, not that one should, I'm, you know, but you know me. Um, that is that is a reflection of the wine you buy and the wine you serve is an extension of of a reflection of who you um, want to be perceived as or or your taste or, or what have you, which is makes which is why it makes wine so intimidating sometimes. But um, you know you want to make sure you make a nice decision, and, and if you don't know too much about wine, chances are you're going to pick one based on the label. Yeah, because you're right. It is a bit of a status thing too, and I'm I'm glad. I mean, I'm glad that I have you as my friend, but I'm glad that the, the wine industry is making it much more approachable and yeah. less intimidating. Because I think that that intimidation factor. I often when they bring it to your, you know, bring it to. Oh, do you want to? You know, do you want to taste it first? I feel like, oh, why am I going through the all? Just like give me the drink, like, like you know, it's like. But I know that I'm intimidated. They're like, you want to taste it? I'm like, mm, taste smells good. Okay, pour it. I, I love that when when we first started talking about this, I was like, oh, thank goodness. Like I, because I, I've watched those, um, I've watched documentaries too, where I see the process of these Somalis, the master Somalis that they go through and these grown men, I think I told you, like, these grown men breaking down in tears because they have to like, they have to like taste a wine, like do a little taste and go, this comes from the Northern region of France. I'm going to say, you know, and they have to like, like the year and all that other stuff. And so for these master Somalis and I'm like, it's just a little less, Leah. I just, I just like to taste it. I don't need to go through it. I'm not taking a test later. So, but well, that's up to the winemakers, right? The winemakers are the experts. The winemakers are the ones that can do all that. And as a marketer, for sure, I have to be well versed in um, wine making and wine making techniques, but um, the winemaker is the wine expert. And mm -hmm. I am the marketing expert. So we all have our roles and we all work together, but can't be all things to also, you know, 
don't feel intimidated in a in a sea of wine because you like 95 percent of the world are like oh i don't know i'll pick that one yeah and and so um i i have a friend my neighbor and friend um works at uh mother parker's tea and she's got these they've got these super testers do you have super testers that go in and then for like, sure things that she said i think she said super palettes like, yes yeah, so people have super palettes i was like tell me about this she says she has done She's like, I have no palate. She's a smoker, and she's like, I don't taste any of it. But there's people that actually have really sensitive Super palates, yeah, very yeah. sensitive. And that's also part of training, too. Like, the more you taste and the more you experiment and the more you do that, then the, the you know, more familiar in the, the synopsis or whatever they are between your taste palate and your brain, you start recognizing hmm. what, those, what those aromas are. Um, but if you don't practice, then you'll, you know, until someone says, oh, do you taste green pepper or do you smell green pepper? Yes, that's what I smell. But until you practice, your brain won't connect with what you're what you're smelling and tasting. It never has for me. You know, you get like, I, I go, oh, this just tastes like wine. This, I mean, I like this wine. This wine is yummy. Or right. Can, and the second yeah. glass gets yummier. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We're almost out of time. Um so uh, one, the one question I often ask people, I love to ask people, like, do you have a mantra, a belief, um, a motivational phrase that, you know, either you say to yourself or that, you know, that you might have? Yeah. Do you have anything that? Um, uh, for me, um, and, I, and I have to say this has come over time, ask for what you want. So if you have an idea and you, um, you know, sometimes it takes time to be able to pull together the presentation and pull together the idea and, and being able to influence and and um, get people to see it your way. But ask, ask for the sale, ask for what you want, ask like, I want, I see this and I want the money to do this and I want to be able to do this. Ask for what you want and then figure out how you get there. Awesome. Yeah. And fig yeah, figure out how you get there and probably figure out how much it's going to cost. <laughs> Oh, that's yeah, but some people are afraid to ask for the sale, okay. whatever that sale looks like. Yeah, and that's—I I wonder if that's a Canadian thing in a way. Um, just the way that we, the way that we engage with each other. I think the one thing I've sort of learned is we're we're, we're much more intimidated to ask for that sale. Even when I was mm -hmm. in sales, Tina, I hated asking for the sale. Oh, I, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't—I hated handing over the paperwork. Like, eh, can you? Uh, <laughs> can you sign the? Can you like? I, we're here as friends, but can you sign the contract now? So <laughs> that's that part I always hated because I felt like it sort of changed relationships. But uh, but you're right. Like if you don't ask, you won't get. And then that really has to do a lot with a little bit of confidence of of you know. Worst that can say is no. It's true. And then you just have to build a better case and then ask again. Yeah, and I I find I have to do it on the days that I'm like fully. I'm feeling like I'm like I'm. I took a big swing the other day asking, you know, asking somebody of something um, that I'm not going to get into because it's no point. Uh, but I had to be in a, in a really good, like, it's okay if they say no mood because there's yeah. some things that I just will be like, I'm just going to be a crush if someone just says no. So yeah, you have to sort of be in, but that's, that's good advice. You know, if you ask for it, you just might get it, you know, and mm -hmm. if they say no, it's not the end of the world. Right. Not the end of the world. So, so how can people reach you, Miss Tina, if they want to, to reach you? Like, well, you um, yeah, I, my uh, Instagram is T squared with two Q's and or I could be reached at uh, LinkedIn. So um, that's an easy way to get me or you can call me or email me directly at uh, Tina.Trushik, T-R-U-S-Z-Y-K at AndrewPeller.com. Yes, I have to check the way your, your name is spelled every time I do Lots it. of consonants, no vowels. <laughs> Good old Eastern European. <laughs> And so the last thing can I say is uh, spasibo, right? Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for chatting with me, love. Oh, thanks for having me on. It was lots of fun. It's so it's so great. And I can't wait to see you in person and give you a big squishy hug. Yay! Yay! <laughs> All right, love. Well, we'll talk to you soon. And, um, and and anybody who wants to watch this, of course, there's going to be a recording of this uh, and also on my blog and, um, and all sorts of other different channels. So, um, yeah. So thanks again, Tina. We'll talk to you soon. Honey. Oh, my pleasure. See you. Bye. Bye.